money that they spent Take another look and fill some time for him Don't cut trees for paper cause it hurts the environment Stop deforestation, yes it's time for him Whoa, an acre of hemp makes twenty barrels of oil No need for pesticides to poison all our soil People got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent Welcome for time, to, time for Hemp. Thank you for tuning in to our show today. We have a very special guest on our show. He's one of the founding fathers of the hemp movement and has been hailed by High Times Magazine as the patron saint of the cannabis movement. He's author of the book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which has been considered the Bible of the hemp movement. And he's been one of the most hardest working activists in the past 17 years, doing everything he can to make this wonderful plant legal. Jack Hare. Jack? Welcome Thanks, to my show. Thanks, guys. How you doing? Hi. Thank you for coming. Okay. Okay. Can, can you tell me how you first began uh, getting involved in the hemp movement and what it was that uh, got you all excited about it and where you're from? Well, it kind of happened in two stages. In 1969, I was 30 years old, and this woman, young lady, turned me on to uh, some pot because she thought it was very square. <laughs> and uh, she thought I'd never had any real feelings. And uh, I told her, of course, I felt everything that any, nobody could feel more than I could feel. But um, she insisted, and because I liked it, I kept trying it. Nothing happened the first two or three times. And one day she came home with some Acapulco gold. Yeah. And she said, I want you to keep smoking these. And I got very stoned. And she put <laughs> earphones on me, and I heard music in color. And I said, wow, this is the best I've ever felt in my life, and it's illegal. <laughs> so. You know, that's how I kind of got involved. And a couple of years later, a friend of mine over a, a little uh, uh, potty had sold me. We had written on the back of a paper bag a 1 to 10 scale. And then we had written the delineation, a 1 to 10 scale, on how good pot was. So that, oh, yeah. yeah. And so then pretty soon, uh, we, we delineated to buzz, mild, high, very high, mild, <laughs> stoned, very stoned, and stone stoned. Right. And um, so what happened at that point was that the government picked up the book that I had written with Al Emanuel and had made it its world standard for some thousands and thousands no. of, really? of, of, yeah, for, for <laughs> ongoing clinical studies. So they, everybody had to say, how, you, how, how good was the grass you just smoked? And these thousands of studies where they're actually smoking in 74, 75, 76. And they'd, say, they'd have to say a six or a seven on my scale. Or <laughs> a seven and then, on and then scale. They, Yeah, and then they had to say, um, did, you have a, did you have a buzz or a mild high? And the buzz, for instance, we had delineated as buzz, the first feeling you got from grass. Mm. that something was different inside you, mild yeah. high, television was a shade clearer. And finally, when we got up to, like, very stoned, you could get lost walking in the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you remember those? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, and so fact. one day I walked into the marijuana office in 1973 for the California Marijuana Initiative, which in 1972 had gotten 34% of the vote and actually made the ballot. And I walked in there, and I didn't know anything about marijuana other than this funny little book that my friend and I had thought we'd put together. And... Um, we met all these kids in there that knew all these esoteric information about cannabis that we did. You know, at first we got that marijuana made almost all the paper on earth. We, we couldn't get up the paper sign with the fiber and fuel sign, but hemp for paper, that almost all paper was made out of marijuana until about the middle of the, or the end of the last century. Here's a book almost 200 years old, completely made out of pot. It's made, see, all paper wow, was made wait from, a minute. all paper was, I know, but all paper was made from rags, and the predominant rag was hemp, marijuana. And this okay. is, so this paper lasts for near ever, and in fact, if it was legal, its pulp would now make all of our paper. One acre of hemp equals four acres of trees and makes every grade of paper. And also, I, I, these kids started telling me that all the towels and diapers and all, all these other things. And I was just interested in getting high, but I thought that was an interesting idea. And this is 1973. Yeah, is that when you first began your research? Well, yeah, I started writing for them, and they told me things like, how could you not research when you find out this? I was 30, maybe 33 at this time, that canvas was the Dutch pronunciation of cannabis the canvas sales, like an old Ironsides and all through the last century, mm -hmm. that the word canvas meant cannabis, and canvas sales were cannabis sales, and canvas covered wagons that went west were cannabis covered wagons. Wow, what a, what a trip. And then, you know, all coming from this one plant, it was softer, warmer, longer lasting. 
It was an incredible plant. And I, I thought, wow, this is interesting. But I never realized how, f how much it could go. It would just go and go and go. That this plant could make all the paper, fiber, fuel to make the food and protein for the whole earth. That it would be the number one food to feed the earth's people and the earth's animals if it wasn't illegal. That's the best protein. It's seed oil almost exactly matches human blood plasma. No other no, seed really? oil on earth does. Birds live 10 to 20 percent longer if they have hemp seed in their, in their diet, whether they're birds in the wild or birds, birds in a cage. So I found out by 1973 and 4 when I found this information mm -hmm. that our politicians probably through complete ignorance, had made the whole system, all of our education, so ignorant that we had become lemmings. We were killing ourselves. The number one plant for paper, fiber, and fuel from the natural cycle had right. been outlawed, that somehow the synthetic cycle had won, when the number one thing in the natural cycle could outproduce it and completely clean up the atmosphere. So my partner, Captain Ed, who had become my partner in 1973 in doing the politics of this, said, we have to, we have to teach everybody in the world. So we went around and told everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a slow process. And as we did, we started to learn more about hemp. Okay. And that's how I got involved in the movement in okay. 1973. Now, in your 18 year walk in this path, you know, I'm sure there's been a, there's been a handful of people who, who have inspired you, or should I say, march in this path, because yeah. you've been out there kicking it. You really have. Yeah. And there's been some people who have inspired you, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. I'm also confident you've come across r reliable resources. Where have you found your, I mean, what are your statistics to back up all the wonderful things that you're spouting out? Well, all of them come from the Department of. Uh, agriculture, both the State Department of Agriculture of Kentucky and Wisconsin, who, by the way, April 5th of 1991 are, is holding the, a brand new meeting on this. Okay. Um, um, I found this in the archives under, this was the uh, actual minutes of the congressional testimony in 1937 in the senatorial testimony. All plastic was to be made out of pot. Um, all paper was to be made out of marijuana. Bulletin 404, 1960. The whole bulletin is here reproduced. It was actually made on marijuana paper, on hemp paper, hemp pulp paper, the first hemp pulp paper in history. I mean, so back just, there they were saying fiber, fuel, paper. Oh, yeah. Paper, and then in right? 1937, they wrote an article that was published in 1938 called Popular Mechanics, New Billion Dollar oh, Crop. Yeah. And this is exactly the way it appeared in Popular Mechanics in February of 1938. Yeah. And what happened when this, when this appeared is that it would make a new machine that brought the, the harvesting down from 300 hours to harvest and break an acre to less than an acre. It would make all the cellophane. It would make all the dynamite, 25,000 new products. First time the word billion had ever been used with an American agriculture crop. First time? First time it had ever been used with an American agriculture crop. And, then, and actually that everybody thought linen was made out of, out of flax. But it actually says here in Popular Mechanics, echoing uh, Britannica, that almost all linen was actually made from hemp, and that none but an expert could tell the difference. Here it says the paper industry offers even greater possibilities, an industry that amounts to over a billion a year. That's about 80 to 100 billion now. Wow. And of that, 80% is imported. But it says right here, but hemp will produce every grade of paper, and government figures estimate 10,000 acres devoted to hemp will yeah. produce as much acres as 40,000 acres of average pulp land. So the whole back of the book, what we took out is hundreds and hundreds it's of all documents. Your documents. And so uh -huh. that everything we say in the front half, there's three, four 400 documents that over and over and over uh, show and prove and From prove and report. Sources. They're all government Our sources. Best. So you don't have to believe me. Go no, spend, I was just curious. You know, yeah. it's just uh, it's okay, a matter of record. Okay, now once you realized all this, you yeah. started putting the p uh, parts together, this yeah. puzzle, and you got this whole picture, right? Yeah. What was your first impression, dude? I mean, what did you feel? Anger, rage, enthusiasm? Quiet, no, I, I, shock, wondered, I, wondered how a, I wondered how a people could outlaw a natural thing. And I was one of the people that probably thought it was okay before I started smoking pot, so I wonder why I did it. And I realized I was ignorant that they didn't teach us this in school. They didn't teach us that the no, flag, right. that the Betsy Ross and the flags were all made out of pot. They didn't tell us that the first and second draft of the Declaration of Independence was made out of pot. Maybe it was important. But you know, it's so important that when you start to tell them, they say children don't need to know, you begin to get suspect of the of the big corporations who run the museums and put out what they want to put out. Or maybe it's just that nobody wants the embarrassment of having admitted they didn't know anything. One of the technicians here, I just told her about hemp for paper and canvas was a Dutch pronunciation of cannabis and all those. Mm -hmm. She said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And then another one did it. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So that you're... means ignorance. I, you can't get mad at ignorance. You can just get mad at the situation that creates ignorance. And in this case, the law, which I decided with my, my partner, Captain Ed, made me take a pledge to do until I was dead, it was legal, or 84, worked for the, uh, for the re-legalization <laughs> of the number one plant for paper, fiber, and fuel, and probably the healthiest single thing a human being ever does. Um, along the way, I found out that, that hemp, when you smoke it, 
dilates your arteries, lowers your blood temperature, your body temperature, lowers uh, your uh, ocular pressure, opens, dilates your bronchioles better than anything else we have, and finally, uh, it lowers your stress, the number one killer on earth. So here is the healthiest thing that statistic after statistic indicated you might even live longer if you smoke pot every day wow. than if you do no drugs whatsoever and you lived eight to 24 years longer than people that used alcohol and tobacco. What kind of idiot would make somebody else be a lemming for some stupid law that politicians in their ignorance must have Good made point. up because if they knew it, Excellent they'd be criminal point. working for pharmaceutical companies <laughs> like point. George Bush used to do with Lilly, <laughs> which was owned by Quail. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Isn't that nice? Now I know that you keep using the word hemp, hemp, hemp. The name of your organization's hemp stands for help and marijuana prohibition. Uh -huh. And hemp seems to be your favorite word. But in all honesty, isn't hemp marijuana? I mean, why aren't you using the word marijuana? Why did you? Why did you? Why do you keep using it and hammering it into people's minds as hemp when it's really marijuana? Well, along the way, I, I began to read all this William Randolph Hearst w yellow journalism, whether it was from him or from his newspaper editors or some. Conjunction but his yellow them. journalism, what do you mean? Yellow journalism. Hearst, uh, the, if you look up yellow journalism in the dictionary, it'll tell you William Randolph Hearst newspaper. It means when you, you uh, do sensational, outrageous stories. And he was doing that with? Well, that, he was doing it with marijuana. He had headlines, marijuana goads boys to bloodlust and murder in 30 days. Well, you know, I've never seen anybody do anything on pot except get the munchies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, and they would say that marijuana turns man into a gunman, that axe murder smoked marijuana cigarette four days before. Oh, kind of like that reefer and, madness Yeah, stuff. well, yeah, and, and, you know, <laughs> and so, and they use the word marijuana, marijuana, marijuana. When I look back, you know what the word marijuana comes from? The Mexican Sonoran uh, colloquialism slang right. for intoxicant. It didn't even mean the flower of the hemp plant since our politicians put out this, they call this marijuana, but actually it's the flower of the hemp plant and the stalk of course is the of, of the of the hemp of the hemp plant. All right. Or from it comes the hemp of the hemp plant. But the word marijuana was just, became known by the poor people, the Mexicans and blacks who smoked it along the border and in the west, southwest and around New Orleans and, um, and they called it marijuana or reefer or griefa. And okay. um, what happened was uh, we ran off first, never used the word hemp. Now, we had hundreds and hundreds of hemp medicines. It had been the number one and two and three medicine in America through most of the 1800s. But until 1863, it was the number one medicine we had in the United States for asthma, for, for, muscle, uh, for mus uh, really? muscular spasms. For tetanus, it was the only thing. When somebody got tetanus, we gave them huge massive doses of, of, of hashish, or, or what they called hemp extractums, or wow. cannabis extractums, and we'd give them so much that they get more in a, in a day or two than you and I have done in our life. Wow, <laughs> pay to and, get sick. And well, wait a second, no, I don't <laughs> think so. These guys didn't like it, but for nine days, while they had the tetanus, which is feces in the blood, basically, and, and before the toxins could put, pass through the, the liver, and you got the and you got the locked jaw, and, and the only thing that could keep your muscles soft enough so you didn't die from this, and to to allow the toxins to pass, was to take huge, massive doses of hashish. Wow! And well, nobody ever died from. It. In fact, I want to repeat that: there's never been a single death from marijuana. Cancer. Not one. Not well, none that we know of, except at the hands of police. I mean, there probably is some car accidents, but it's well known that people people do seem to drive a lot safer. They've done study after study after study from car and driver okay. to the University of Washington and that they, um, they found out that they, people actually drive a little safer as far as getting home than even people that are straight. They just miss their freeway exits more often. But <laughs> <laughs> no, so when you're straight, you miss your freeway exits and go, wow, but when you're stoned, you go, I understand Whoa. we've got a... <laughs> I like that. I, under <laughs> <laughs> I, I relate. <clears throat> uh, I understand that uh, you, we got a roll in that we want to share with the audience that okay. uh, it, you've been doing a, a hemp tour around the nation several years off and on, uh -huh. and you take your message across the United I, States. I speak a couple hundred colleges a year. And you're probably one of the best known speakers on, on the topic. Uh -huh. And I believe here this, this particular uh, was shown at Santa Clarita. I don't know, I've done Santa, Santa Clara. And Santa Clara, California. Or Santa Cruz. <laughs> Santa Cruz, who knows? Santa something in California. <laughs> okay. Because your message is pretty strong and pretty much the same and consistent, which makes you different from a lot of people who go out there and say one thing one day, one day the next, and one day the next. Like, uh, aren't we all happy campers type of <laughs> comments, right? I'm a happy camper. I'm a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it might be possible to take that role in now, please. So without any further ado, let me introduce to you the man who's really behind this thing, Jack Herr.
and the crew you guys got it in uh, Santa Cruz between Theodora, uh, No Guns, Melody, and uh, Carlos. The comic news we put in that, and I know my friend Rachel got some information out of it. Uh, nice turnout, and I hope that one of the things you learned from me tonight is how I learned about this, which was like, I had no idea. I mean, if any of you think you didn't have any idea, I didn't have any idea that marijuana, when I, when I started writing, when I wrote my first book about pot, I had no idea that marijuana and hemp came from the same plant. In fact, I wouldn't have known what hemp was. And uh, I think I had heard it in made rope, but I figured Dan Lines made rope. I, I mean, I, I guess I found out later that Dan Lines did. But who knows? Here I was with, you know, smoking pot. I'm 30 years old, I just got divorced, and I smoked some pot. Well, how I smoked some pot was this girl decided that she wanted me to get high because she thought I was pretty square. And uh, I thought I was really cool. I was, you know, I, I had read thousands of books. I had known all sorts of Chinese restaurants. I had, uh, <laughs> and uh, one night in an argument over some pot that a friend of mine and I had sold, he had sold to me. We had argued about the grade of the marijuana he had sold me. And whether it was, uh, uh, he, he, I, he called it an eight or a nine, and I called it a five or a six. And we sat down, stoned, and on the back of a paper bag, wrote out what became the first trans high quotations years later. When, uh, you know, and it was, you know, how much you paid for lives, pounds, and kilos in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and San Francisco. LA, and LA, and this was back in 1972, late 72 and early 73. And I had, you know, and then this cartoonist came along and these other people came along and everybody had a little idea of what you should say about these things, uh, these different stages of getting high. So we got high again and we made up a set of rules for getting high which was based on <laughs> And before we get to the serious part, you gotta remember, I love this plant. I do. Really love this plant. <laughs> That's great. I can obviously see that you have appreciation for Mother Earth. And I see that you got a standing ovation, a lot of appreciation from the people there. But as you go across the country, what kind of response do you get? What kind of attitudes do you receive in Nebraska, Indiana, Mayberry, Area FD, you know? Well, in a lot of cases, we're talking to the choir. Where a lot of cases, the people that show up three, four, five hundred at a college of the choir. But a lot of the students bring along other students, force other students, people that have either read our information, our book, or High Times, okay. and say, you've got to listen to this guy. You've got to dispute it and refute it and get off your position. And even people that smoke pot oftentimes think they're doing something morally bad because they were taught it was morally bad. They oh, don't yeah, want to drink illegal. alcohol, maybe. They don't want to smoke tobacco, but they want to smoke a little bit of pot once in a while. And um, the response I've gotten has been, been really great because the television channels come out, the newspapers come out, the state, uh, the city newspapers, the college newspapers, and they have given us... They come out usually with an attitude to treat us tongue in cheek, and then we challenge them with a ten thousand dollar challenge. Ten thousand what? Prove our information wrong. We give them a ten thousand dollar challenge of hemp. Yeah, we, we're betting that there's no other plant on earth that you could outlaw the fossil fuels for All cars. Right. You could outlaw the cutting down of trees for paper. All right. That you could there's you could and if you were looking for the natural cycle from a plant that grows on earth, mm -hmm. that all the other plants that grow on the planet Earth don't even equal a fraction of hemp on an annual, renewable, sustainable, latitude-wise, climate-wise, soil-wide, planet-wide, drought-wide basis. And hemp is the number one plant that grows on our planet. And you got a 10, ten grand challenge stating that, well, yeah, backing and, you up. And uh, it's nobody, well, one guy, Dr. Walker at LSU, took it up, a doctor of horticulture, took it up, <laughs> came back and said we may be as much as 5% wrong. He didn't say we were, but we did, refuted him and disputed him. And Dr. Walker is now one of my... Uh, one of my uh, biggest supporters in the country. <laughs> so, I mean, we don't have anybody. I mean, it's just information. If anybody's right. going to get mad at information, you should be mad at the government 
for yeah. not giving you this information. Evidently. I mean, Evidently. obviously, this information is available through your encyclopedia and dictionary. Mm -hmm. I mean, why shouldn't we have known cannabis and canvas were the same thing? Could we have outlawed canvas? No, no. We outlawed marijuana, going back to an earlier question. We yeah, outlawed right. marijuana because they didn't know. So I decided to use the word hemp, the real, true English word. Just like it says in our law books here in California, hemp. you must use uh, the dictionary English word. And the dictionary English word of this plant is hemp. It's Latinized and, and, and Greek, Greekized. Um, um, botany is a, a botanical name. is called cannabis. And it's been called hundreds of other names from boo to Mary Warner to Mary Jane, <laughs> but uh, Dang and time, Bong yeah. and Daga in, in Africa, where it's they've been the number one uh, um, re religious ritualistic drug as well as uh, relaxant uh, for most of Africa. Uh, so. What, what, what I ever saw wrong with this plant was nothing. I couldn't find anything wrong. I couldn't find any dead, dead bodies except at the hands of police. Yeah. I couldn't find yeah, any course. lung cancers. Here was, it causes more precancerous lesions, but I couldn't find any of those. I went to Dr. Donald Tashkin, who did the study, which all the Partnership for Drug Free America quotes supposedly on the lungs. I take part in the study. I get paid by the government to smoke pot for you. No, I have, I have since Hey, how do you sign up? Well, you sign up, but you got to smoke really garbage pot. You smoke much better pot if you know a, a, farm, <laughs> a farmer in Humboldt you do it County. On your own. There you go. <laughs> Somebody with a good, good halide life. You know, and, and I never felt bad. You know, when a person sells a tobacco pipe, you're killing somebody 8 to 24 years sooner. But if you sell him a marijuana pipe that he's going to put pot in, he's going to live longer than somebody that does no drugs. Longer. And he's going to live 8 to 24 years longer than the wow. person smoking the tobacco pipe. But for the marijuana pipe, he's going to go to jail for three years minimum under new guidelines of the Bush administration. For and a why pipe? That, for a pipe. If he sells it in a store, like what the old, the old quote, head shops, which never even had pipes, they used to have just things to turn your head around in the early 60s until uh, some kids brought some pipes in, and they sold as well or better than the posters. Well, praise day. God for freedoms in America. Oh, right? yeah, what, the, uh, the end of freedom. <laughs> but, you know, the fact is that nobody can beat a fact, and I don't care, you can go beat up on a, a yeah, third rate, truth. you can go beat up on a third rate country. But when you start beating up on millions of its citizens, 20 or 30 millions of citizens, and telling us we're crazy, when we have the number one plant on earth for paper, fiber, and fuel, that we don't need to take a fuel out of Kuwait. We do not need to put carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere from fossil fuels yeah. that stay up forever. That we have an annual renewable, sustainable plants on earth that can do it, and the one that does it best is outlawed. Then it's a outlawed. pretty insane society. Yeah. And I know that my mama would have told me I was an insane lemming if I followed this politics <laughs> in one inch. <laughs> You know, that's what All I tell right. kids when I go to high schools. I teach at high schools. I just taught in Santa Monica High Schools this day, and I got these kids. You know, they want to know that their politicians are lemmings. They want to know these facts. Okay, now you you've talked about politicians, and you've talked about all the people and the doctors and so on and so on. How about a debate? I mean, I how about one on who? Who have I you de debated? My Congressman John Conyers, Detroit, head of the uh, House Judiciary Committee on, Cr on Crime under Rangel. Uh, 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 and he did not know any of this information. I debated him, and he lost the debate about 175 to 1 there at his own alma mater in Detroit, the University of Detroit at Detroit U. And I think the only person left on his side of the auditorium uh -huh. was his aide. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Who else? Well, he didn't know this information. It was like an unfair fight. Here, I've been practicing for well, this yeah, fight all my life. I just, I just did a medical doctor in, um, in Gainesville who uh, came to debate me, and he said, uh, would you give your child marijuana as a medicine for asthma? I said, of course. I gave it to my children when they were 9 11 for asthma. Before that, I used to take them to the Before Dr. Tashkin in UCLA had told me in 73 and 74 that this was the best medicine in the world for asthma, we were taking my son Mark to the hospital out in Simi Valley. We were putting him in an oxygen tank. We were shooting with him adrenaline. Mm. He was taking tons of theopoline. Theopoline is the only legal medicine you can get. It kills kids 6 to 12 years sooner. There's 65 deaths a year, 6,500, wow. uh, excuse me, 43 deaths last year. 6,500 people were admitted to um, emergency rooms for the theopoline, the only legal asthma medicine. And, uh, and uh, what else did it do? Oh, about 1,000 brain deaths from kids who had temperature when they took theopoly. Now, marijuana has none of these effects. Marijuana works much safer, much faster. There's never been a known death from it. And wow. so I beat him in debate in front of his own college there in Gainesville. <laughs> and he came over and congratulated me when I gave him the paper on theopoly and asthma. <laughs> so we don't lose any debates. I, was, I, I had a guy from, um, from uh, the DEA said that, uh, well, you can make fuel out of anything. We can make it out of eucalyptus. I said, you can grow 100 million pounds a pot for every one pound of eucalyptus leaves. You said you can still make a fuel out of it. The DEA isn't playing with a full deck. No. They're just a bunch of fascist people okay. that want to enforce the laws, as okay. far as I can see, so they can get more power. Okay, now from what I understand, that it's true that you have financed the movement, 
financed the book, got the book out there, got all the word out there. Yeah. You had been the one out there just kicking ass, right? Yeah, nobody can beat a fact. I found right. that out when I was a little kid. My dad told me about all the relatives that were killed during World War II, and he said, don't you ever put up with anybody shoving you around. Wow. I had cops beat me up in L.A. so many times, I used to make the headlines in the paper here in the <laughs> metro section all the time out there petitioning for this uh, thing. They well, used to do all sorts of weird things. And we decided to take all my wealth and all my ability to make money and finance this movement. And my book it seems to be doing a, a quite good job. Greatest underground, uh, underground book, book in the, the country. Yeah. yeah. Very congratulations yeah. on that, too. Can I, I put mean the that. plug for the book? Yeah, please. Okay, you can get the book. It's called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. It's the... Uh, Hemp and the Marijuana Conspiracy, and uh, you can get it from Hemp, H-E-M-P, 5632 Van Nuys Boulevard, Van Nuys, California, 91401. It's twelve ninety five plus $2 mailing and handling to Hemp, 5632 Van Nuys Boulevard, Van Nuys, California, 91402. twelve ninety five $2 mailing and handling. We'll get it right back to you. All the facts and documentations are in there so that nobody has to guess about this. You'll be in sure ground. You'll be clear when you communicate about hemp. Okay. I, Is there any closing statement you'd like to make at the well, moment? You've got just about 30 seconds or so. Thousands of kids have come and told me their whole families have come back together over hemp, that they've read the book, brought it to their moms and dads, and they're together again smoking with their parents. So I'll tell you, the time for reefer madness is over. Yeah. And the time for reefer gladness should begin. All right. <laughs> All right. I'd like to thank Jack for being on our show. It has been educational and eye-opening and fun. Thanks, guys. And I hope that this show has an ability to bring the truth out to the nation. I have been told that we are now being shown in about 25 states, 47 cities, and our audiences are growing. If you have anything that you think would participate in what we're doing here, we are focusing soon on the victims of this war. Jack has friends who are suffering as victims, don't you, Jack? Till the next century, they're in prison for doing something, smoking a flower from the ground. And we want to find some way to get them free. That we want to put faces on these victims. Please contact us. If you're aware of people in your area who have knowledge that we need to bring to our show so that we can enlighten the people who are observing us, please do. I know Jack will have other people to direct to us in the future, and I hope to have him back on our show. Anytime you want to come back, Jack, please don't even hesitate to ask. Come on back. All right. And I ask that our, li that our audience out there tell their friends about the show and do everything you can to get the truth spread out that Jack has worked so hard for. He's moved 17 years and he's still going, and there's a reason for it. He believes in what he's doing, and it must be true. Hemp is the one plant that is going to save this planet. And I believe that with the help of people like Jack, Captain Ed, and all the other people who are working very hard, this will come true. I ask you to get out there, raise your voice, let them know that our brothers and sisters must be set free. And remember, the next time you see me on your television show, you'll know that we're going to get together and teach you everything we can about this plant. And it will be time for hemp. Thank you. Say, did you ever meet that uh, reaper man? No, I never met the guy. Tell me about it. Oh, no, you're not kidding me now, are you? You never met the reaper man? Oh, no, you never met the reaper man? And yet you say you swim to China and you wanted to sell me South Carolina? I believe you know the reaper man. Did you ever meet the funny reaper man? You never met the funny reaper man? And yet you say you walk the ocean anytime you take a notion? Yeah, I believe you've seen the reaper man. <laughs>